Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontefract. Today, uh, I say friend, professor at McGill's uh, University's Days Hotel, Faculty of Management, Dr. Carl Moore. He's also an associate fellow at Green Templeton College at Oxford University. What I love about Carl is that he spends so much time uh, interacting with both the current state of leaders, so CEOs and C-suite, but also future leaders. And we're going to spend some time with him and on his thoughts about millennials and Gen Zs. Um, starting with his PhD, Carl studied CEOs and how they lead and develop strategies at McGill. He teaches an MBA course, CEO Insights, where over 30 CEOs come to join the class for an hour each fall. The class has been turned into an hour-long radio show right across Canada, syndicated called the CEO series. It's quite fantastic. His uh, newest book will be released soon. It's called OK Boomers, Working with Millennials and Zeds, or Zs, depending where you are, which studies the way that millennials and Gen Zs act as leaders and the way that managers need to create, uh, act and create a meaningful interactions with those same uh, genres. Carl's taught on executive MBA programs everywhere, uh, the, the, all the known uh, and great institutions like Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge, Oxford, of course, uh, McGill, also INSEAD, and he's been bestowed a truckload of awards. Uh, Carl, as we're saying in the green room, I wish we were doing this over a beer or a coffee, but uh, welcome to the show. First question for you, Carl, um, what's happening with CEOs these days? So you get to chat with a lot of them, but uh, what's your take on the state of our organizations and what you know ultimately CEOs are, are thinking and, and where they're at? Well, I talked to the, the president of Shopify out of uh, uh, Ottawa this morning, as a matter of fact. I've got two other interviews. One is a guy who runs Industrial Alliance, a big insurance company out of Quebec City. And then Susan Kane, who wrote Quiet, now wrote a book called Bitter, Bittersweet. I get to sit down with one or two a week. You know, one of the big conversations has been COVID-19. How did it go? How's it going after that? And it's something where the work from home issue is one where at Shopify, they're basically saying, you don't need to come to the office. Mm. What they're going to do is get together every month or two, your group for a couple of days and do things. And it will probably be not in Ottawa or Toronto, but maybe in Berlin one time, it may be in the Silicon Valley. And it's something where wherever you live to go to the Valley or go to Berlin, it's not a hardship for a couple of days, right. you know, and your spouse and family go, that's fine, honey, go enjoy yourselves. It's a couple of days. Just, you know, be helpful when you get back. So it's something where the nature of work has changed for a lot of companies. Though as a boomer, I'm still liking, you know, in person, I taught on the EMBA here at McGill last Friday, it's down at Stanford a couple of weeks ago, and I loved being in the classroom with human beings. But there's a real shift there in work. There's also a sense in retailing that we've gone very much online, had the CEO of Aldo recently, uh, you know, talk to all sorts of people in retailing about how that's evolving and changing. So the world has gone on and we're looking at how we work, um, where we hire people very differently than two or three years ago. And we've also thought about kind of how strategy is more emergent ah. and more deliberate. So uh, my colleague, uh, Henry Mintzberg has talked about this for years and to some degree, Michael Porter, we gave him an honorary doctor about six years ago at McGill. So I spent an hour with him for the Globe and Mail. And he taught me years ago at Harvard. Um, kind of that approach of CEO-led top-down is still used. So I interviewed the CEO of Air France, Ben Smith, who ran Canada, Air Canada, a big part of Air Canada. When I saw him in Paris, and he was going forward to the board with billions of dollars of purchase of planes. He's got to own that. He's got to take it to the board because it's an incredibly important decision. But a lot of, so some strategy still comes from the top, mm -hmm. but a lot of strategy coming now from uh, frontline troops, Zs and millennials who have what we call boundary spanners. They have one foot in the real world and one foot in the company. <laughs> and they come up with real world problems that they solve with other people, not just in their own organization, but you know other parts of the company. And the job of senior management is not so much to have their ideas, as the spot good ones as they emerge from the real work with real customers and the environment, real competitors. So that is something which is not for all organizations, but is increasingly the way we do strategy. 
and it highlights the importance of more junior people in the process. But on the other hand, um, the CEO gets to decide the strategy at a high level. So their job is to not have the ideas, but to recognize good ones when they come along to them. So it's a different a shift of role. And this is a relief to most senior executives that they don't have to have all the ideas because they recognize they didn't. And that was too much pressure on them. So we see an evolution coming out of the pandemic of being more flexible, more adaptable, relationship with customers is different. And we're gonna have another pandemic at some point, the scientists tell us, and I think would be much better suited to handle it because we can go back to what we did in the last couple of years. Fascinating. If Carl, we were to touch on emergent strategy and and its relationship, I suppose, right, to where is the state of our organizational culture right now? What is it that you've seen CEOs change when it comes to some of the traits or characteristics or behaviors, indeed, you know, the actions that 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 uh, follow up the values of that organization to become emergent? Is it is it more collaborative? Uh, is there give and take? Uh, what other kind of aspects do you see that CEOs are now inculcating within the organization? Well, being more entrepreneurial, and this is something where I have students who, uh, you know, do an MBA, go be an entrepreneur, have an entrepreneur, and then join the corporate world. And in the past, the corporate world, when I worked for IBM would reject that. You know, they just, yeah. you don't follow the rules, you don't want to show respect. Where today, they like people who have been entrepreneurs, but can accept a little bit of authority. So it's a, there's a tension there where I, the, the, the president of Shopify, Toby, told me this morning that, that it used to be quite two different worlds, but what they want at Shopify, which is 10,000 people, are people with an entrepreneurial spirit to bring that to them as they pivot and, mm. and, and face an uncertain world. So it's something where big companies want that kind of entrepreneurial approach but are willing to accept a bit of authority. And the fact is that you do have a boss light. So it's not the boss that I grew up with, that you may have grew up with, Dan, where it's kind of like, I'm the boss, you're not, what don't you understand? Mm -hmm. I gave you an order, like get on with it, where they're more willing to say, so I wrote an article for the Globe a couple of years ago that was the second most viewed in the Globe online was never apologize, never explain bad ideas with millennials. When I said it should apologize easily, but more fundamentally, explain everything. So I explain things to my undergraduates who work for me, because I want them to say, Carl, very interesting, but however, something is a little off. Have you considered this? Because if I put out what my thinking is, they will argue with me to some degree, which I want them to, and it will change our thinking. So it's something where by explaining and setting out your reasoning, so it's interesting what they do at uh, Shopify is that when they send a, a quarterly report to the board, they send it to all employees. So they're being very open and the employees can go very interesting, but had you thought of this and it's that you're probably 85, 90% correct, but it's the 10% on the margins that it can allow you to get to a better place. Mm. So that being very open, I think is a, a kind of direction that goes to help people be more entrepreneurial, but within the context of the resources, and the brand, et cetera, of a big organization. Well, as I've uh, always said, uh, you can't have a flat organization without a hierarchy. Hence, you know, my point, uh, every organization ought to strive to become a flat army where that armada uh, thinking, right, where there's a captain to the ship, but we're all on the same ship. So let's work together to get to the destination, I think is apropos to kind of what you're getting at. So yeah. to follow that up, what what are some of the more emerging, if you will, trends that you're seeing, not only teaching in EMBAs and MBAs, but working with millennials and Gen Zs? What are they, uh, I guess, pining for in their organizations? Well, it's interesting because what I argue in the book, in one sense, is that people over 45 the degree, like you and I, Dan, were taught a modern worldview. People under 35 the degree were taught a postmodern worldview. Mm. And by understanding their worldview, it gets to things like the decline of hierarchy. So when I was a kid, we'd go to see a doctor, my mom and I, he'd have a stethoscope, was always a man, white coat, he'd be behind a desk you could land an aircraft on. <laughs> and he was God, and we were just saluting and doing what he suggested. Yeah. And today when I go to the doctor, I, I Google on the 24 bus on the way to see her and I go, I call her doc. 
And I say, I have three theories of what's wrong with me based on Google. And so it's less hierarchy. I show respect, but there's a wider view of truth within medicine. So we used to call them quacks. And we have a department of um, medicine, which is alternative medicine at McGill. So instead of being quacks, they're alternative, partly because we have, you know, in, in BC, have a lot of people coming from Asia, from China, where when I grew up, there was one Asian family in my high school in Toronto, where today a lot of my neighbors are Chinese. So they go, hey, Dan, go see uh, the Chinese herbal medicine person. You might go, yeah, I like Susan. I trust her judgment. I'll go try it out. And so there's, we're, we're open to a variety of ways of looking at medicine. So who has truth? How much hierarchy is there? How do we work together is fundamentally shifted for young people. And when I talk about postmodern world thought, as I did last week, people in the 30s and 40s goes, yeah, that's me. But the 20 year old just simply doesn't understand any other worldview. And so I, I said to them, we can call them snowflakes once in a while, once in a while, <laughs> but you know, we shouldn't make fun of them very often because they're largely right. And they are the future. So get over it, say la vie, get on with it. Except that there's very little hierarchy that if you don't listen to their ideas, you're a jerk. Like you, you must listen to ideas. And I say to my students, 25% of the time you're reverse mentoring me. Uh. And I say to them, what's the flip side? And almost no undergraduate has ever uh, acknowledged or been able to tell me the flip side. And I say to them, 75% of the time I'm mentoring you. And they go, oh, okay. And I think that's, but what is new? And I have a couple 80 year olds that mentor me. It, it does not occur to them that I should reverse mentor them, but I send LinkedIn messages to have lunch with former students. And I say to them, let's grab a coffee. I need to be reverse mentored. And generally they, they laugh, they go, sure. Because they're teaching me about today's world. So I have a 19 year old putting together my TikTok channel because I don't know what to do. And they yeah. just, get it. Now yeah. I said to them, no dancing that, you know, we're going to have some limits here to what I'm going to do, but they will come to me with scripts. They come with me ideas and I'll accept 95% of them because they just understand that world in a way I don't. So things like technology, it's a no brainer, social media, young people get it. Um, so I, I would say that if you're not listening and being reverse mentored by your millennials and Z's, you're a jerk. You need to grow up and get on with it. On the other hand, once in a while, I'll tell stories. I mean, I told stories a bunch of EMBAs in the 40s and 50s, and they roared at laughter at the silliness of undergraduates. But I said, it is funny, but being woke is largely a good thing or politically correct. It's showing respect for people that we did not show enough respect in the past, by and large. It gets carried away once in a while. So, Darren, I was in class the other day, and I was talking about introverts and extroverts and ambiverts, and I said, John here is a very complex human being. And I said, he, and I stopped in the middle of the word he, because I'm not supposed to um, assign gender to anyone. And he laughed and they all laughed because he, you know, he has a beard. Like, you know, you and I are bald, like clearly we're men. And on the other hand, you might've had, you know, a gender change and that's fine if you did. And it would be a tough life if you did. But I just realized that I shouldn't assign gender but allow them to tell me what they are. And if they want to be a they, well, that's fine. Because if you're, if you're a they, it's a tough life. And I should be understanding towards you that it's not been easy because you, you're different than most people. So th there's a, a certain silliness, but by and large, there's a degree of wisdom there about today's world. One of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, in OK Boomers is recently, when I say recently, uh, the past six weeks or so, for whatever reason, it's caught my attention on Twitter uh, that there's this sort of um, lost generation called Gen X, and they seem to be uh, either uh, overcome with doubt, like who are they as a generation, or they're being forgotten about between the boomers, millennials, and Gen Z. So, you know, clearly they're a, a pretty large cohort uh, somewhere, I guess, born between, what, 19... 67 and 80, let's call it, or thereabouts. Um, so what's your take on Gen X in, in this riddle of solving our organization's, um, you know, plight? 
Well, it's something where, you know, they're becoming largely in charge. The boomers are retiring, uh, you know, and stepping away or taking roles just because they're in 60s and 70s where they don't have the energy they once had. So the extras are in charge to a certain degree. The millennials are our middle managers. They're entrepreneurs to some degree. They're important. But the Xers, like, calm down. You run the world to a large degree. Now, do you have to take on board the concerns of the younger millennials and the Zs? Absolutely. But it's just comforting to be in charge. Like, you know, um, David Benstein runs Aldo, big shoe company out of Montreal. And David is 6'7", 300 pounds. He's not overweight. He's just giant. He's the CEO. He's the son of Aldo. So when he goes to a strategy meeting as a very much an extrovert, what he needs to do is not say much because if he says something, everybody goes, that's why you're boss, I love it. So he's learned to be a good introvert and listen to everyone else. And when he comes in his head, he knows when he comes in. And during the meeting of a strategy development, what is in his head evolves. Happy thought at the end, he's CEO, he gets to decide. And we that's what we're gonna do. But people can say, I can see in the strategy, my ideas were part of it, that I contributed it to it. So it's something where, you know, the extras are in charge, you get to do the strategy, you get to make decisions, relax, but you're gonna have to listen to young people more than you were listened to. Sorry about that. I wish <laughs> the boomers would listen to you more, but we were largely not listened to by the seniors. Seniors may well argue with that, but, you know, that's our memory as boomers. So the world's changed, but you're the big bosses. That's a comforting thought. Okay. Well, you touched on something there as well. I wanted to, to ask you about, and that is the, the spectrum of, um, you know, our, our take on our personalities, I suppose, whether we are extroverts, ambiverts, or introverts. So you've done a lot of research on this over the years. So where, what's your, what's the general take that you see um, both on those definitions? And then secondly, on why they're important to know inside of our organizations as we aspire to, to better organizations. Well, the title of the book is, we're all ambiverts now, I'm doing with Stanford. And what an ambivert is, so the central idea between introversion and extroversion is a response to stimulation. So introverts are not shy people necessarily, but they're people that after a certain amount of stimulation tip over and go enough of that. So at a party, they go to the bathroom and hide there for a while just to get a break. Now I tell them, don't do that. People need to use the bathroom. Take your phone, go to the garden, go, uh-huh, yep. Mm -hmm. And people will leave you alone because you're on your phone. But what you need is, and as an extreme extrovert, I seek out stimulation. So I take extrovert breaks. So I read the literature was, there was lots, there was nothing but extrovert breaks, lots on introvert breaks. And I said, why is that? It's not fair. But I recognize when I sit in my office here, Dan, and I write for a couple hours, uh, ironically, but introverts, I can't take it anymore. Do you hear the pain in my voice? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I need to go down one floor down. I have an endless supply of undergrads I teach in Italy and giving grades to, but they're very friendly. And they'll, you know, at some point they'll go extrovert break, but I recharge <laughs> my batteries. So an ambivert is someone that can act like an introvert at times and an extrovert at times. And what I'm arguing is that as an executive, regardless of your hard wiring, you need to be like that. So as an extrovert, or David Benson, as a very much an expert, acts like an introvert when he talks about strategy, because that's the right executive thing to do. But afterward, he wanders around the building and acts like an extrovert, which is, you know, management by walking around. You might remember that from the past. So it's a good thing to do, but it recharges his battery after being quiet for a while. So when I... McKinsey and BCG, one of the things they often do when they form new teams is talk about who's more introverted or extroverted. And if you say you're an introvert, I'll give you some hours, leave you alone, because it's so useful for you to think. On the other hand, if you're extroverted, uh, and I am, I'll say, I'm having dinner down the restaurant at seven. Whoever wants to join me, love to see you. The introverts may go back to the room and watch Netflix and relax and recharge. The extroverts come down to recharge. So by understanding who you are, I can manage and work with you more effectively. So when introverts work for me, I won't ask them right away early in a meeting what they think. I give them time to think, connect the dots, which they like to do, and I'll look at them. Mm. And they'll go, they'll nod a little bit, no or yes. And if they nod, no, I won't call them. If they say yes, I'll go, 
hey, Dan, what do you think? And you will tend to say, so, not to say you, Dan, but an introvert will tend to say something quite profound and insightful because they thought about it, connected the dots, and have been quiet thinking about it, taking board other people's comments. But I won't call on them unless they say, nod with it, that it's all right. So what I'm doing is I understand my boss, my employees, whether they're more introvert or expert, I work with them in a way that's appropriate for their personality, saying that we used to think all leaders were extroverts. And part of what I've come up with after about 500 interviews of C-suite executives is that it's probably 40% of executives are introverts, 40% are extroverts, and about 20% are genuine ambiverts. Uh. But saying is that regardless of your hard wiring, as an executive, you've got to act like the other because it's simply like Claude Majot ran CM, huge introvert. And he had, um, they gave him a coach when he was COO to help him become CEO. And he had to be a bit more extroverted. And he gave him a clicker five times a day. He had to uh, act like an extrovert. <laughs> so he would get in the elevator in the morning and he would normally look at his feet and save us $200,000 on the uh, six uh, stories of the elevator. But instead, he's go, good morning, Dan. Know your name. Say something like, boy, it's starting to become summer out there. You're not going to argue with. And then say, Dan, you really did a great job in your presentation of the board last week. Your work is really valuable. Gets off the elevator because that's what a CEO does. So I ran into the principal of McGill this morning. And uh, we chatted because she, she knows that that's what a principal does. With faculty, she knows is chat, remembers their names. And that's good CEO leadership. Now, if you can't do that at all, you probably can't be a C-suite executive, but that's all right because the world needs only a few C-suite executives. Remember at TELUS, there's, you know, I'm, I'm having a, your old boss on the show, Darren, in a couple of weeks. Um, of 50,000 so are people, there's only, you know, 30 in the C-suite. Most of us are people managing or doing the work and actually making TELUS successful. Mm -hmm. It's not just the C-suite. Right. Well, you, you've touched on something I wanted to dig a little deeper in because it dawned on me during uh, that wonderful depiction, especially 40-40-20, I love that, it, that is it incumbent upon a leader, whether it's the CEO or at least the C-suite, to develop and or portray that element of empathy? Because if they're not, then how is it that they're not empathizing with how someone recharges or regenerates or what their natural uh, wanted disposition is in front of people or behind the scenes? Is, is that a correlator, uh, Carl? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think coming out of the pandemic, a lot of CEOs are talking about being more empathetic. And part of it was like the guy at Shopify, and I'll be out my show in a couple of weeks. So, you know, you said it in a public way so I can pass it on is that, he talked about some of the things he wrestled with in the midst of the pandemic. His kids were probably three and one then. And the things he wrestled with that he talked about, he wrestled with mental health issues, which many of us have. And you think of the, the woman at the Olympics or the woman at the French tennis open, where the reaction of many boomers was to mock them. But after a while, and young people went away and said, yeah, that's, you know, mental is something we wrestle with. And I think that being more open to other people's things and more vulnerable is part of what we've come out of with from the pandemic. And, and being empathetic and vulnerable and sharing is something I think it's, it's senior executives and leaders have got to do that more than a couple of years ago even. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, someone from your hometown, Danielle Lamar, former CEO of Cirque du Soleil, now executive chairperson, came out in an interview with me and said, you know, if my employees, which are, of course, the performers, are out there uh, vulnerable every day, putting themselves on stage uh, for fear of an audience ridicule or a mistake or getting injured, then I better be as vulnerable, if not more vulnerable, as the senior most leader in that organization. I think, I think that's complementary to what you're getting at. No, absolutely. So, Carl, uh, last question, and then we'll find out more from you and where we can learn more about you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a half full guy when it comes to the, the proverbial glass. I, I look at things and say, hey, I'm optimistic. I'm positive. I, I think there's a chance here to, to recover or to learn more. Where, where are you at, again, in this um, adjudication state right now as we hopefully, knock on wood, enter this post-pandemic era 
What's the what's keeping you up at the half full? I'm so happy to see this happening right now. Based on your research, whether it is CEOs, uh, whether it's millennials, Gen Z, just tell me a, a bit about this is reason for hope, Dan. <laughs> I think it's a, we've come out with having learned a lot of lessons. We talked about empathy. We talked about vulnerability, being more open to different personality types, being open to Gen Zs as being so it's getting away from kind of one model of leadership. And mm -hmm. I, I did, a, I started a call about a year and a half ago for the Globe Mail interview indigenous leaders with an indigenous uh, doctor, um, medical doctor here that I taught. And it's just something where we're going, there's greater variety than we thought in the past. And we can learn from different places. So I'll do something hopefully at C2 Montreal with um, Jennifer, who I, uh, doctor, and then the woman who runs a uh, neighbor of mine runs uh, APTN. The Aboriginal People's Television Network about what are the things that I've learned from Indigenous leaders so that I can be, you know, and what I'm arguing is we're all Indigenous now, like we're all ambiverts now, but it's something where when you think of climate change and some of the big issues the world is facing, we can look for a variety of sources for insight and understanding rather than just from one group of people. And we'll get it wrong to some degree, but we'll also get it right writer by greater variety of sources of insight, knowledge, and truth these days. Oh, I love that. Carl, uh, wonderful to catch up with you. Where can we find out more about Carl Moore and the upcoming books? Well, I have a website, uh, which one of my students sent up, uh, which is Carl dot, it's Carl Moore at org. Carl Moore dot org? Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. And uh, can we catch up with you on, on what channels? I, I'm assuming we're going to go see the more Mambo on TikTok soon, but uh, <laughs> any other social media channels we can see you? Well, I have the podcast. My radio show, which is across Canada on Bell Media, is uh, also comes out of a podcast on Monday morning. So if you go Carl Moore and CO series will come up. And the advantage of my name uh, with Carl the K, Moore two O's, there's a football player and IT consultant, but it's a more unusual name, though. Pontefract, I think you win the uh, the, the uh, laurels on that one is having a more unusual name in a sense. <laughs> yeah, when you when you look up Pontefract, it's either a, a bridge that's uh, now broken in uh, the land of York, or it's these black licorices that are quite delicious called Pontefract cakes. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Carl, uh, always great to catch up with you. I can't wait for that next beer or coffee uh, when we cross paths again, either in Montreal or another city. Thanks again for being on the show, my man. My pleasure. See you later.